Awesome. So um, this this morning, I, I want to talk to you about something that is very dear to my heart. Um, and the title of my or the title of the message today is "What is Repentance?" What is repentance? Um, you know, research shows that the most neglected uh, message today um, in the African church is the message of repentance. And it, ha it has been overtaken by the message of prosperity. Okay? It has been over overtaken by the message of get your breakthrough, your miracle, your season, and your harvest. Okay, um, it has also been overtaken by the message of um, miracles, signs, and wonders. You know? um, that is that is what people are looking for nowadays. People are looking for either a feel-good message, you know, um, but they don't want a message that confronts sin. They don't want a message that that rebukes and corrects you know they want a message whereby they get what they want you know if it's a miracle or whether it's healing it's not bad healing is not bad i'm not against healing i'm not against miracles i'm not against prosperity i know that god prospers his people i understand that but that is not the gospel okay and and we are going to actually see that um in just a few a few minutes because when you when you look at the public ministry of Christ when he was here on earth his first decree or his first command amri yake ya kwanza ilikuwa repent that was his first message repent in fact repentance was a constant motive in all his public um, preaching Matthew chapter 4 verse 17 records his first public words this is what the Bible says it says from that time Jesus began to preach saying repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand Luke chapter 5 verse 32 Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's a pattern. This is his message. His first ever message in public. Repentance. Si kuja kuwaita wenye haki, bali wenye dhambi wapate kutubu. Luke chapter 13 verse 3 says, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. So, msipotubu, pia nyinyi mtaangamia vivyo, hivyo. This is Jesus speaking. These are his words. So, Jesus preached repentance. The Old Testament prophets that came before Jesus, like Elijah, Isaiah, Noah, Jonah, Malachi, they all preached repentance. All of them preached repentance. But now, but what's interesting to me is after Malachi, Malachi is the last book of the Old, Te of the Old Testament. After Malachi, God went silent for 400 years. But when he finally speaks, after 400 years, when he finally speaks, or when he finally broke his silence, he sends a prophet by the name of John the Baptist. And the first decree from the mouth of his prophet, John, is repent. After 400 years, you would expect God maybe to say something different. But his first decree is repent. Amri. That is his first decree. So that just means that the message has never changed. 
the message in the Old Testament and the New is still what? Repent. In fact, the baptism of John was called the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So the message never changed. It never changed. So when Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, he called his disciples. And this is what he told them. He told them exactly what they are to preach. We find it in Luke chapter 24 verse 47. Jesus said, And that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. The message is still repentance. This is at the end of his ministry, his earthly ministry. So Jesus at the beginning of his earthly ministry preached repentance. At the end of his earthly ministry, he charged his disciples to call people to repentance. And that is exactly what the apostles did. The Bible tells us on the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up and he was filled with the Holy Ghost. And he preached salvation in Christ or faith in Christ. And listen to, listen to what um, the Bible records in Acts chapter 2 verse 37. Peter preached saving faith in Christ. Listen to what it says. It says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And guess what Peter's response was? The next verse tells us. Acts chapter 2 verse 37. In Asimanini, in Asima, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he says, Repent and be baptized. This is the message calling people to repentance. He never told them, Come and get your miracle, your, your season, your breakthrough, and your harvest. No, he told them to repent. The Apostle Paul also called people to repentance. Acts chapter 17 verse 30. The Bible says, the times, this is Paul speaking, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So you can see the pattern. Acts chapter 20 from verse 19 to 21. Paul says, How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you, and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance toward who? Toward God and faith toward Jesus Christ. So it's clear the message of the New Testament and the Old Testament is repentance. And that is the Great Commission. That is the last message Jesus gave to his disciples when he was about to ascend into heaven. Tell you, Ambia, go ye and make what? Disciples of many nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That was the Great Commission, to go and call people to repentance. So now the big question is, what is repentance? Sindio, what is repentance? Now, for those of you who are taking notes, you can take notes using your phone. Um, I think these are some things that you would, um, it would be better if you wrote them down. Now, repentance. What is repentance? Repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia. Now, we all know that the New Testament, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, isn't it? And the New Testament was written in, in Greek, right? It was written in Greek. So, the word metanoia, repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia, which means to change one's mind or to change your mind. That is what it means. 
But what I want you to understand is that the change of mind it's talking about here is not intellectual. It's not merely intellectual. It's moral. It's moral. The issue in repentance is moral, not intellectual. Swala la toba ni maadili. Siyo akili tu. It's moral. Okay? Now, I want to give you an example of what I mean when I say that 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 repentance is moral, not intellectual. Can I have two people? Can I have two people? You and Kujenita Fadali. Just come. I want to use you guys as an example. All right? So so come here, just come here. So we have person A, person A, come on this other side, come here, come here. Araka, is it time? You, you, can, you can come here, okay? So we have, we have, we have person, person A and we have person B, okay? Now these two are all in sin. Okay? They don't have an intimate relationship with God. They are not believers, okay? So you have person A and person B. Now person A is and person B they are walking in sin, they are in sexual immorality, they have multiple sexual partners, okay, they are fornicating, they are smoking, they are drinking, they are partying, wanafanya anasa, wanafanya kila kitu unezafikiria. Everything a sinner is supposed to do. They are doing it, both of them. But now you have person A here. Person A decides, you know what, I want to stop drinking, I want to stop smoking. I want to start going to the gym, I want to start taking care of myself, I want to, I want to start eating healthy. Okay, I want to start eating healthy, I want to change my lifestyle. Alright, so, and he says, you know what, I'll also, I, I want to start, I want to find one lady, I'm tired of sleeping with many women. I want to be, I want to have only one. I just want to change my lifestyle. Now, that is person A. Now, person B, on the other hand, is tired. This person here knows that God is not happy with their lifestyle. This person here knows that they are sinning against God. They are, they, so this person is moaning of a sin. In fact, this person is experiencing what the Bible calls godly sorrow. In the book of um, in the book of Second Corinthians chapter seven, seven verse ten. In that one, we are for godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to what? To salvation. Second Corinthians chapter seven verse ten. Maana huzuni iliyokuwa jinsi ya mungu hufanya toba liletalo wakovu lisilo na majuto bali huzuni ya dunia hufanya nini? Mauti. So godly sorrow produces repentance, but worldly sorrow produces what? Death. That's what the Bible says. So this person here is moaning and grieving over sin. They know that they are sinning against God. They have a deep sense of conviction and contrition. Okay? So they are really disturbed. They are not at peace. And they want to change. But now you have this other person here who wants to change but does not feel the same way this person feels. Okay? So this person, for him, ni mabadiliko ya? Tabia. It's just uh, behavioral modification or behavior modification. That's all it is. There is no conviction of sin. There is no contrition. Okay? So that is the difference between intellectual and moral. Thank you so much. So, repentance has to do with morality. It, it's a change of morals. So the change of mind I'm talking about involves a turning away from the love of sin, like this person is doing, person B, and turning
running to God for salvation. So let me give you a biblical definition of repentance and how it looks like. This is how it looks like. Repentance is a discovery of the evil of sin. A mourning that we have committed it, a resolution to forsake it, it is in fact a change of mind of a very deep and practical character which makes the man love what once he hated and hate what once he loved. That is repentance. Toba, repentance. Toba ni ugunduzi wa uovu wa dhambi, maombolezo ambayo tumefanya, azimio la kuacha, kwa kweli ni mabadiliko ya akili, ya tabia na ya vitendo ambayo hufanya mtu kupenda kile alichokuwa akichukia na kuchukia kile alichokuwa akipenda that is repentance okay so the sinner begins to love what god loves and he begins to hate what god hate god hates to receive forgiveness the sinner must forsake his wickedness and turn to god for forgiveness Listen to what Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 55 verse 7. It says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 says, repent therefore and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. So he's saying, turn again. So if you are going this way, you turn and you start going this way. So repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. To buni basi, mreje ili dhambi zenyu zifutwe, zipate kuja nyakati za kuburudishwa kwa kuwako kwa kebuana. Now, true repentance involves a radical change in behavior. This is another point. True repentance involves a radical change in behavior. The book of Luke chapter 3 verse 8 describes the relationship between repentance and behavior. Luke chapter 3 verse 8 says, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Bear fruits in keeping with repentance. So in other words, what you believe and how you live should be the same. What you believe and how you act should be the same. So what you believe and your fruits should be the same. You must bear fruits worthy of repentance. So true repentance involves a radical change in behavior. What you believe and your behavior has to be the same. Now how do we know a true believer or someone who has truly repented from someone who is a false believer and has not truly repented how do we know the difference well the bible tells us the bible says you shall know them by their fruits that's how you know whether someone has genuinely truly repented and forsaken their wickedness you shall know them by their fruits. Matthew chapter 7 verse 18 says, A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Mti muema hawezi kuzama matunda mabaya. Wala mti muovu kuzama matunda mazuri. It's impossible. Because the Bible says whatever is in the heart, the Bible says... From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever is in the heart is expressed through our words. You can't hide it. 
Your fruit will always give you away. You can say some very nice things, but your fruits will always give you away. Now in Matthew chapter 3 verse 7 and 8, John the Baptist rebukes the Pharisees for coming to him, asking him to baptize them. And John the Baptist says to them, because he knows that their fruits are wicked. So John the Baptist refuses to baptize them because they don't have fruits worthy of repentance. And listen to what John the Baptist says. Listen to what the Bible says. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come for baptism, he said to them, so I'm a good John the Baptist are, 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 are baptized, right? Listen to the first thing John the Baptist says to them. You broad of vipers. So the first thing he does is he exposes their bad fruit. He calls out their bad fruit. And then he says, who warned you to flee from the divine wrath that is to come? Or the judgment to come? So produce fruit that is consistent with repentance. Demonstrating new behavior that proves a change of heart and a conscious decision to turn away from sin. A conscious decision, decision to turn away from sin. Acts chapter 26 verse 20 says, First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in, in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached, this is Paul speaking, I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds, by their fruits. Paul is saying, repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their fruits. So true repentance involves a radical change in behavior. So repentance is what happens inside of us. Repentance is what happens inside of us that leads that leads to the fruits of new behavior. I will say that again. Repentance is what happens inside of us that leads to fruits of new behavior. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of heart, that leads to a change in actions. This change involves both a turning away from the love of sin and turning to God for salvation. So a person who has truly repented, a person who has truly repented of his sin, a person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life. Here's another point. Repentance is necessary for salvation. Repentance is necessary for salvation. But repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. But it is necessary. No one can come or no one can repent and come to God unless God pulls that person to himself. John chapter 6 verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. The Bible says. So no one can come to Christ unless God himself draws that person to himself. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 25 to 26. With gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant, keyword, grant them repentance. So who is giving the repentance here? It's God. If perhaps
perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. It's talking about the unbeliever. The person who doesn't want God. The person who opposes everything about God. And all of us, if you're not born again, in fact, all of us are born into sin. We are born into sin. But God is the one who grants repentance. It's God who grants repentance. In fact, it's God who granted Israel, the chosen people, repentance. Acts chapter 5 verse 31 says, God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give, talking about Christ, as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. So it's God who granted repentance to Israel through Christ. Acts chapter 11 verse 18 says, when they had these things, now the children of Israel have received, have been granted repentance by God. Because repentance is a gift. It's by grace that we receive repentance. Now, that's, those are the people of God. Those are the, that's the Jewish nation. Now, how about the Gentiles, like us, me and you? Let's see what the Bible says. Has God granted us repentance? Let's see. Acts chapter 11 verse 18 says, When they had these things, they fell silent and glorified God, saying, To the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. So God has also granted us as Gentiles repentance. The same way he granted the children of Israel repentance. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 11 says, do not forget, 11, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 11 to 13 says, do not forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called and circumcised heathens by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ, this is before we were granted repentance. Days you are living apart from Christ. You are excluded from the citizenship among the people of Israel. And you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been made, but, but, but now you have been brought near to Him through the blood of Christ. So that is how we have received repentance through Christ. Now we have been engrafted in the family of God. So repentance is a gift. It's not a work, but it is necessary for salvation. Now, this verse that I just read, or the verses that I just read, indicate repentance is something that God gives. It is only possible because of His grace. And the amazing thing is, God has already played His part. God has already played His part. God has already played his part. Now it's up to us. He has already granted us repentance. He has already played his part. Now it's our part. Listen to what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 21 says. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this from God, who reconciled us. Keyword. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Who reconciled us? God. Who grants us repentance? God. He reconciled us to himself through his son. It says that God was, and then he continues to say, 
that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So God has already played his part. He gave his son. And we were reconciled to him through his son. So he has already granted us the gift of repentance. He has already said it's possible for you to come. It's possible for us to have a relationship. It's possible for you to be forgiven. So repentance makes reconciliation possible. Repentance is the first step to reconciliation. Now the Bible says that God wants all men everywhere to repent. That's what God wants. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So the reason why probably you're still alive today, the reason why you're still alive is because God is giving you another opportunity to repent. The reason why you are not dead is because God is giving you an opportunity to repent. The Bible says that he is patient with you, not wanting you to perish or not wanting anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. And that is why in Luke chapter 5 verse 32, as we had read earlier, Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's why Christ came. His purpose right there. He came to call sinners to repentance. Now, the Bible tells us what happens when they reject His repentance. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 2 verse 4 and 5. Romans chapter 2 from verse 4 to 5. The Bible says, But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up the wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. You see, Jesus is coming soon. You see, the Bible says every time we sin, every time we sin, as unbelievers, not as believers, as unbelievers, the Bible says every time we sin, we store up the wrath of God that will be revealed on the day of judgment. That's what the Bible is saying. And the Bible, Jesus is coming. And the Bible says that he's coming to judge the living and the dead. The Bible says that he has set a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. He has set a day, a specific day, when he will judge the world in righteousness. And the Bible says, And each man shall give an account of himself before God for the things done in the body, whether good or evil. Each man shall give an account. So Christ is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon to judge the world in righteousness. And this time when he comes, he's not coming as a baby in a manger. This time when he comes, he's not coming riding on a donkey. This time when he comes, he's not coming as, as a meek, humble person. He's not coming as a child. He's coming as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's not coming to give you mercy. He's coming to pour his wrath and judgment upon this wicked world. 
and he's coming to take his people. The people who repented. And when they repented, he gave them their right, his righteousness. He's coming soon. So my friends, if you have not repented and put your faith in Jesus Christ, you won't inherit eternal life. You won't. Because the Bible says the wrath of God abides on you. Because you have rejected the offering of his son that grants you repentance to salvation. So God is a God who wants a relationship with you. He wants a relationship. We need God. But without forsaking sin, we cannot have a relationship with God. Because what sin does, you see the Bible calls sin lawlessness. Sin is any deviation from God's perfect standard of righteousness in thought, word, and deed. That is sin. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is destructive behavior. And sin is what separates us from God. We cannot have a relationship with God when we are living in habitual sin. It is impossible. You cannot be on God's side at the same time be on the side of sin. You can't have a relationship with God. It's impossible. So what we need to be saved from is sin. And God has already offered a way for us to be saved through his son. The Bible says he made his own son become sin. He who knew no sin. That we might become the righteousness of God. So if you don't have a relationship with God. If you don't have a relationship with his son. Then you're in, in big, big trouble. In big trouble. Because God is calling you to be humble. The only way to come to God is to be humble. You cannot worship God when you're proud. God has already made a way through his son, Jesus. That's how we receive salvation. Amen? So my friends, I'm done. But if there's anyone who would love to give or to surrender their life to God right now, I want to call you or I want you to raise your hand when everyone else is either bowing their head but it doesn't really matter to me to be honest. Whether your hand is up or it doesn't matter to me whether people are looking at you or not. Because why, why should we be ashamed? Why should you be ashamed that, that you're giving your life to the Lord? Something that we need to be proud of. When you raise your hand up. The Bible says if you deny me before my father, will, before men I will deny you before my father. So if there's any one of you who would want to surrender, commit their life to God this minute, just raise your hand where you're seated. Raise your hand. But if you have, God bless you. If there's anyone who has backslidden and they feel they need to come back to God, just raise your hand. There is no sin that God cannot forgive. The Bible says that His grace is sufficient. His grace is enough. His grace is enough. 
the Bible says you need to repent so that the, 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 the refreshing would come from the presence of God. Amen? Alright, so let's pray. Let's bow our heads and pray. Everlasting Father, we give you all the glory, all the praise. Thank you for the word that has come forth. Father, thank you for calling us to repentance. For your word says that it is your desire that none should perish, but that all should have everlasting life. That all should come to repentance. And I thank you that you have offered that repentance through your son, Jesus. And through him, the Bible says that you are in him reconciling the world to yourself. And his righteousness was imputed upon us. And we have become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So we thank you for granting us repentance that leads to salvation. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you that your son took upon himself the punishment that we deserved. When he hung on the cross, and when he was on the cross, he cried out, It is finished. In other words, the debt that we owed and could not pay, he paid it on the cross. So that we would be reconciled back to you. Your wrath was upon his life. And your mercy was upon us. Your grace you have given to us. That is enough. So we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his offering. For he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the whole world, the Bible says. That it is through him and him alone that we have eternal life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the resurrection and the life. And no one comes to the Father unless he goes through the Son. And Lord, we put our hope and our trust and our confidence in that he died on the cross and on the third day he was raised from the dead. And now he sits at the right, right hand of God the Father in majesty, in power, in sovereignty, and in all the authority and dominion. For he is the supreme one. So God, we thank you for your son. We thank you that he is our substitutionary atonement. He is the perfect sacrifice for sin. The perfect atonement for sin. That in Adam many died, but in Christ many have been made alive. So we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for you love us so much that you sent your one and only son. As your word says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I thank you that everlasting life is not a place, Lord. Everlasting life is a person and his name is Jesus. I thank you that the way is not, is not, is, is not, is not a, a philosophy. The way is a person. The truth is a person. The life is a person. Eternal life. And that eternal life is found in Christ and Christ alone. So Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your one and only begotten son. That through him we have eternal life. We pray this, Lord. Believing and trusting. In Jesus' mighty name. Lord, I pray for everyone here that is not a believer. Father, I pray that you would convict them of their sin. Father, I pray that you would speak to them, that you would visit them in a dream and warn them, Lord, for the wrath that is to come. For your wrath abides on every sinner, every unrepentant heart, every stubborn heart. Father, I pray that you would speak to them, O oh Lord. Convict them. Father, may they have contrition in their heart. And Lord, may they cry out to you 